So the business scaled very fast. By middle of 2013, grew 10 to 15x. It felt like everything was breaking. We had hundreds of boxes strewn around in our offices. Sometimes the servers would crash. USPS had just arrived at our doorsteps and said that we might want to sort of take your CEO into jail because you're violating all these USPS roles. And said, you know, I'm going to cut down our growth by 80%. I'm going to cut down my marketing spend by 80%. It's a difficult decision. This is James Courier with NFX. We're a seed stage venture capital firm started by a group of entrepreneurs. The NFX podcast aims to discover for the founder community what it takes to build iconic companies. Today, we're here at the Poshmark headquarters in Redwood City, California with Manish Chandra, the co-founder and CEO of Poshmark, which is one of the most successful online marketplaces of all time and truly the most amazing story you've never heard. This is a company that has more people making money on it than Airbnb, Lyft, Uber, and Etsy combined. So a quick background, Manish Chandra founded Poshmark in 2011 with Tracy's son. In my belief, it's the most brilliantly conceived and executed social commerce platform in the Western world. It's the social commerce company by which all others will be measured. The company's raised 160 million of venture capital so far, and they've recently welcomed a new board member in Serena Williams, who's extremely active in fashion, technology, and now in venture capital. Manish and I have known each other now for 15 years, and we've been working together for eight on Poshmark. Today, Manish is gonna take us inside Poshmark and share for founders what it took to get here. His fundraising, developing his marketplace dynamics, network effects, and the personal growth that goes along with it. I believe we're gonna be hearing a lot about Poshmark over the next 10 years. Why? It's clear to me that the network effects are just beginning to kick in. So we're really just at the beginning of the Poshmark story. So let's get started. So we believe that behind every iconic founder is a fascinating story about their childhood. What was childhood like for you? Yeah, I grew up um, in small towns in India, um, and my father was a judge, so we would get transferred every two to three years. The theory in India was that if you transfer judges, they won't be corrupt. And so that was sort of uh, one of the reasons we were transferred. So I had to be very quick to sort of settle into a new school, a new sort of society, and that was part of my growing up, you know, uh, in, in being this very flexible, adaptable sort of process. I was uh, sent to spend my summers with my grandfather. And my grandfather owned a, a large sort of wholesale pharmaceutical store in the middle of a place called Chamni Chowk, which is a hustling, bustling marketplace in Delhi. And um, I started to go there when I was eight. And in those days, there was just sort of level of freedom. So even at eight or nine, I was free to roam around the entire bazaar. And um, now that I think about it, I don't think anybody would allow their kid to just walk around yeah, right. unaccompanied. Things and have um, I don't know how it affected me, but just seeing people talking, haggling, hustling, um, I think definitely gave me an appreciation of the power of the world of commerce. Through all these movements, sometimes people would lose a year or two. I somehow ended up gaining a year or two. I, I finished high school at 15 and was admitted to um, a school called IIT Kanpur. And um, I wanted to go to their computer science program. I think there was definitely a meme. All of us were applying to the United States and, and colleges. And for me, I was very much influenced by uh, an author called Ayn Rand, which was, you know, all about objectivism and freedom. So my whole sort of thing was, I wanted to be in a place where people are highly objective, very free, not driven by, by norms. And what brought you to Silicon Valley? So my first 15 years were spent in enterprise software. Um, I worked for, I would say, progressively smaller companies. So when I was at Intel, there were 10,000 folks and then slowly realized that the database was not their core business. So I wanted to look for a real database company. So I chose Sybase, which was a very small company at that time. So I joined them and there were 80, 90 people. By the time I left five years later, we'd gone through a public offering and there were 6,000. And then you went on to join Versata. Why? I felt like um, I wanted to be part of a startup again as Cybis had become big. So I ended up joining an eight-person company. I was the head of products at that time. So that company started to scale and we took that company public in 2000. Mm -hmm. And at the peak when I left them, we were over 600 people. Was this when you started to think about starting your own company? So 03, 04, we were remodeling our home. And as we were remodeling our home, the shopping was really, really hard. And it's it's sort of very hard to imagine today with, you know, with mobile shopping and all kinds of sophisticated things that exist, what the world was like, but it was really, really hard. And so I started to see the need for this product, which was collaborative shopping kind of a product, getting everyone on the same page. 
And um, I kept rejecting it, saying, you know, who am I to do this? I'm an enterprise mm -hmm. software guy. Mm -hmm. I have no idea of consumers, no idea of advertising, no idea of what the experience should be like. So for almost like six, nine months, I kept saying, no, 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 no. And then the desire or sort of... Uh, the idea would, the idea would go, go away if everything felt like a nail. So your first consumer startup was called Caboodle, and it was a social bookmarking app for commerce. But how did you make that jump into consumer? Around that time is when I started to sort of put together a group, which was uh, how could I connect to the best minds in sort of consumer. And that's when we first started to meet yeah, and connect around what was a SIG. And, uh, you know, Reed Hoffman was there in that group, David Hornick, some of the really interesting people were coming together. And I got to viscerally start to learn from some of the best thinkers. And one of the things I remember from those times is how to rethink and rewire my brain. Enterprise software is a lot about productivity, shortening the cycles, you know, messaging, whereas consumer software is a lot more about how you feel and how it makes you feel and how you sort of engage with them. It's also about productivity. It's also about other things, but ultimately the emotion part. And that took some time for me to transform through that journey. I'll tell you, the number of people who, from enterprise software, who have tried to do consumer is tens of thousands of people. And the number who've succeeded is so low. It's so hard to make that transition. You really have to have a flexible mind and even a flexible heart, if you will. Right? You have to have such levels of empathy in order to make that switch over because you've been successful in your other markets. You've been successful at your other jobs by doing things a certain way. And so your synaptic patterns get built around that and to adopt whole new synaptic patterns, which are alien, is so hard to do. I mean, that's, that's an amazing accomplishment to make that transition. But there's got to be something you're doing behind the scenes that enables all this. What should founders understand about what you were doing that made all these great moves work? Caboodle, in many ways, uh, was the predecessor to Pinterest in mm -hmm. terms of, uh, we coined the term social shopping, but there were many sort of things around simplification that we missed in that journey. So if it's successful, but it could have been way bigger had my thinking there. We were trying to do a lot of biz dev and partnership and distributions, which don't work when you're trying to perfect the consumer experience. There was stuff that we could tap into from a network effect perspective that we didn't enhance in, in Caboodle days. Yeah, when you're running a startup, it's so easy to follow every opportunity. Uh, but we do a lot of work with our founders, right? Pushing them to simplify and simplify, to just focus on the one or the two things where they get the most leverage. But the things that I loved and learned from Caboodle was the power of community. We built a very passionate community of a few million users who were very connected, very passionate users. The second was just understanding people's connection to their products um, and how sort of they think about it, including fashion and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And third was the power of simplicity, how simplifying and progressively simplifying leads to scale and seeing where we had gaps and seeing where we could uh, imagine and then the last piece was my insight and in sort of looking at Caboodle and looking at where we could take it is uh, the analogy I sort of give is the power of a coffee cup and power of Starbucks, which is how big something can become is as much in your imagination. So if you think of a coffee cup and you look at a coffee cup, somebody can just look at a coffee cup and drink it. Somebody can imagine a coffee cup into a coffee cart and create a small coffee cart. Somebody takes it into a coffee shop. Somebody takes it into a string of coffee shops. But there was someone who looked at a coffee cup and imagined a whole Starbucks. So I think the power of reimagining what something can become was also clear to me as I stepped out of Caboodle and looked at all the things which we're taking. And recently Pinterest went public, congrats to Ben, and sort of an idea where Ben was able to reimagine that where my imagination ended at Caboodle, he was able to reimagine to make something very different. And so when I committed to a Poshmark journey, it was to serve hundreds of millions of people, give them the power to be an entrepreneur, but do it through a very social platform, which had very fair playing field, easy, and ultimately create the largest fashion and lifestyle platform that would be bigger than any other fashion lifestyle platform. That's sort of the journey we are on. When did the light turn on for you? Did it happen in a moment when you came up with the idea for Poshmark? Because I got to say, you know, in 2011, you and I and Tracy's son are sitting on the floor of my office, my home office in Palo Alto, and we're editing your deck and you haven't raised any money yet. And um, we're talking through what's going to work. You described a product to me and a business plan to me that it's the most invariant business plan I've seen uh, in my career. It must have come to you at a moment. It must have come to you over several weeks. Well, how did this, you and Tracy talk about it? How did it come to you? I remember um, seeing iPhone 4 in August on in a vacation. My friend was using it. 
And that uh, phone was so powerful at that point in time, both in its ability to capture pictures and transmit pictures and view them simultaneously, it felt like it would be transformative. Mm -hmm. And then right around August or September, I saw this little app, I think uh, it was called Instagram. And the combination of all of these things reclicked and and sort of the idea of Poshmark was reborn in my mind very, very clearly at that mm -hmm. point in time. Tracy that night happened to be at Mayfield. So I waited for her uh, in SF and then the three of us met and uh, I kind of described the idea to her and she was like, okay, this finally makes sense. And so that's sort of we started the journey mm -hmm. in that whole process. The difference I think was uh, between my previous journeys was I was much surer about my thought process. Mm -hmm. I was much more willing to bet all on a single direction mm -hmm. and the simplicity didn't scare me. It actually delighted me. So it was a very simple process. And we said, we're gonna only do it on an iPhone, only on mobile, which was very contrary. Yes, it was. Yes, it and was. Uh, we were going to keep everything very simple. We're gonna charge a flat commission. We're gonna have a flat shipping system. We're gonna take care of all of the daily things. And the discovery model would be entirely social. Now these are a bunch of bets, mobile, social, simplicity, etc. They were very contrary, and each of them were somewhat contrary to what the norm was at that point in time. But you felt very certain about it. And, and you know, Naveen Chada, who's been with you th through this whole journey of, of Poshmark, uh, once you wrote the business plan, he's he's just been stalwart in his belief but in Naveen, you. Naveen, you, yeah. Kanwal, um, and, uh, and Jeff Clavier were all sort of there. Yes. And I remember many of them just trusted me, and then you were helping me in terms of thinking about the network piece. So in fact, if, if I remember the first name we came up with, of how to position the product was fashion shopping network. And in yeah. fact, uh, in some ways, the, the whole sort of power of this social commerce as we think of ourselves today was really this world of network commerce. Mm -hmm. And and I remember brainstorming and coming up with those vocabularies and words yeah. uh, with you and Stan, and those have largely still been there. It's, it's sometimes counterintuitive as product people, right? But we found with the most successful companies that when you really think about the language, the descriptors of what you're building, and you articulate this to the whole team who's building the product, it, it's very powerful because it can literally change the way your team builds, which is what you're saying has happened. In three months, we had a basic prototype out that we were starting to test in the market. And uh, through that first year, we had 100, 150 users total, right? The goal was to get most of them active. And our marketplace, even though it's a two-sided marketplace, there's a high rate of participation on both sides because it's fashion. Unique. That was, it was a very unique and, and ended up causing a lot of problems later on in terms of just understanding what we were doing from a data perspective. But that time was exciting because we could activate a person both buyers and sellers, sellers and sellers, and sellers were buyers. Um, that's where through that process of discovery, we came upon this notion of posh party, which is our virtual live parties, which have been a whole engine of growth for us. That was sort of the phase of, I would say, market discovery, market fit, and just see if people will actually use these things. And um, a lot of things we did was actually through physical events. We would get together with users, teach them how to take photographs. And it was early. So we would actually hand out iPod videos, which is uh, people may not even know what it is today, but it was like an iPhone, but without the phone. I, I, touch, the, I, I touch, touch, I touch, I touch. I think that's the word. And they, they used it and they started to post photos because nobody, many people didn't have a phone at that time. And, and Instagram so, hadn't taught everybody to take amazing photos yet. Yeah. They were trying to. It was it filters. was very early. Uh, then the second phase was really, we, we felt like we were starting to see something really interesting. And one of the things to me in the early stages of consumer product, and, and we remember talking about it in 06, 07 on this topic is really that the best way to understand a consumer product is engagement and return rate of your users, not growth. And that was incredible when we launched. We only had a thousand or so users, but the average engagement time was 20, 22 minutes a day, right. which is today 23 six to 27 to minutes a day, six a day. to eight engagements a day. Yeah. Today it's like 23 to 27 minutes a day. Yeah. And so that was to me very, very powerful. People were still buying a little bit, selling a little bit. We didn't have search, it was all social. Mm -hmm. And the parties were working, people would hang out for the whole party, but there was no distribution engines. There was nothing really, the cost of distribution was insanely expensive. There were really crude ad networks that were available. On Word mobile. of mouth was hard because, yep. you know, and getting, we were them, only, getting from them from the web to the download was hard. Very, very hard. Um, we didn't have an Android product. We didn't have a men's product. We were just women, iPhone, no web either. So we decided to just start to throw some physical events. So we took this virtual posh party that we have into physical events. And that turned out to be a surprisingly interesting growth engine for us. So we threw probably in the first half of 2012, I would call it a form of growth hacking, mm -hmm. and uh, but also helped us continue to scale the community because we 
have this high touch point with different folks. Um, and then they were right there in the room and you could ask some questions. What do you like about this? What do you like about that? And it also encourages the whole team to come to the posh parties and see the enthusiasm of the consumers and realize that this is a wonderful company to be with. This is a wonderful product to work on. It's a wonderful community to be part of and get everybody energized and excited. It uh, kills about 18 birds with one stone, right? It did. It did. Then the third phase was in 2013. And that was what I call scaling and understanding the power of scaling and managing it. And I remember, I still have this vivid memory of a conversation. It was like January 16th of 2013. I was lying on a Saturday morning in my bed and talking to you on the phone. It was, I think, in between some soccer games, I think you found time to talk to me. And we were talking about how fast should the business scale. And you were saying, Manish, make sure that it's not super fast. And at that time, I was like, gung-ho, let's go. And so the business scaled very fast. From 2012 to 2013, we grew 10 to 15x. Uh, There's really interesting distribution engines that had come around, et cetera, to the point that by middle of 2013, it felt like everything was breaking. We had hundreds of boxes strewn around in our offices. Uh, parties were not scaling. They were crashing. Sometimes the servers would crash. Um, USPS had just arrived at our doorsteps and said that we might want to sort of take your CEO into jail because you're violating all these USPS roles. All of our payment providers had said that you need to find another payment provider. We can't really support your payment method, even though it was so secure. And in the middle of all of these things, we were trying to figure out what should we do around financing and everything. So I made you mean the fundraising, fundraising yeah. and sort of the next level of sort of because um, we're spending money growth. fast. We were spending money we're fast, so fast and we were, and the unit economics of the business were deteriorating. Not that the engagement of the users was really high and the community was very fast, but just the whole sort of system was not yet there. Mm-hmm. So it was, so I took a step back and went back to Naveen over at Mayfield and, and Menlo who had invested and said, you know, guys, I'm going to cut down our growth by 80%. I'm going to cut down my marketing spend by 80%. And part of it is I don't want to just basically get into a place where we are effectively continue to spend money like crazy and not grow and, and, and effectively go into a bad situation. It was a difficult decision. It was a very difficult decision in particular because there was about eight other VC-backed companies in the online fashion space at the time. Time. And the competition in TechCrunch and every place else was everywhere. There was so much pressure at the board level and from everything else for you to just take the market and win and grow at that moment. And you looked at those metrics and you realized that it wasn't going to work. It was not going to work. The system wasn't there. It was not the right thing to do for our community either because we were not servicing them correctly. So we cut down our marketing spend by 90%. So at a time when you're growing fast, you have competition biting at your heels, everyone around you is pushing you to hit the accelerator more, you push the brakes. And this moment right here, this is critical because you're betting everything on a few key strategic moves. What were they? So the big thing we had to do at that time was rebuild our partnership with USPS, which led to the creation of Bosch Post, which is the country's first sort of fashion and lifestyle shipping label, which has been a fantastic sort of partnership, yeah. which is allows... Was it label to, F or something? What the, yeah, the la- label P. It's basically label you can P. put as much stuff in any kind of box mm-hmm. and ship it across the country. It goes priority post up to five pounds, mm-hmm. and it's a flat rate. And you, you know, worked for the with the U.S. Postal Service to develop that, define it, get it passed, get it approved, and launch it into the system. Them, all the way to the Postmaster General. and All yeah. the way to the Postmaster General, particularly to support the shipping for Poshmark. And that's why you did it. For your shipping community. for Poshmark. And our vision was that anybody who sort of has to ship something shouldn't have to worry about how to ship it, how much it will cost them to ship it. Mm-hmm. The thing about fashion is that people may spend a week or two deciding. But once they've decided, they want to wear it tomorrow. So we wanted fast shipping. We have five plus million nodes across the country shipping. So it's a highly distributed network to each other. Today, we have five million people who are selling and shipping their fashion on Poshmark using the Poshmark label. So I, as a user, decide to sell something. You'll let me print out a label, which I can then stick on any box with this with this Posh label for the USPS. And just ship it. And just ship it. It just goes. And, that, and so five million people yeah, doing just that goes. today in the United it's States. It's super simple. So anybody can get started you know, on that process. You know, you know, I want to point this out because as founders think about what they're doing is hard. Come on, man. You got the U.S. Postal Generals change the whole rules to support your business. We so did. for the founders who are listening, like think about how deep you need to go to build the kind of company you want to build and you might need to do something like that or beyond. Okay, so big bet number one was on shipping. What was the second bet you made? Um, we also want to take away every non-essential pain from our seller community. So the second thing was payments. So we were end of 13 and 
every single payment processor in the country, every single one of them, and they're all today chasing us for our business, had rejected us. Then something happened at the beginning of 14, which was, I would say, lucky for us, is Braintree, which was an independent company, got acquired by PayPal. And while PayPal or Braintree individually couldn't support our business model combined, Magically, they could. And so we got this lucky break of this thing. And we had actually signed with, signed up with a payment processor who had agreed to support us. And at the last minute, asked us for a three-month escrow, mm-hmm. which we our, our balance sheet couldn't handle that. Right. So we had to walk away from that. And that led to creation of Posh Pay, mm-hmm. which is our unique payment uh, processing thing. The third thing we tried to fight, and we only just recently succeeded, is we wanted to create automatic collection of sales tax and remittance for our sellers. Mm-hmm. We went to the governments and and ask them that we want to collect sales tax for you. Right, and give it to you. And give it to you. They wouldn't allow us to do that. Mm. So for a year, we kind of kept collecting sales tax with the hope that one day they'll allow us and we'll remit to them. They didn't. In fact, they forced us to remit it back to our sellers, mm. uh, to the buyers. Mm. I'm, I'm happy to say that just about uh, two months back, we finally launched Posh Remit, which collects sales tax on behalf of every single state government, city and local government in the country that wants tax to be collected on behalf of our sellers and remits it back to them. Posh and that remit. Posh it just recently launched. It took seven years, seven years to get there. And so now at this point, if you think about it, your shipping is simple, your payment is simple, mm-hmm. all of the government integration is simple. So you can focus on two things that sellers love to do, <clears> which <throat> is how to merchandise their product and make it easy to have the conversations with their customers. And that's the magic Being sort of so what we've created. But it takes a long time. So going back to your advice from a, from a founder's perspective is really you have to stick to the customer experience. If you're not focused on the customer experience, in this case, both the seller and the shopper experience and simplifying the world and simplifying the world and simplifying the world for them, I think somebody else is going to come and take it over. In any area that we have lapsed, there is probably somebody else who's doing it for them. And that is sort of something which is our core pursuit is to make it easy on both sides. And getting the government to change, getting the postal service to change, getting the payment provided, these are some of the hardest people to get to change. And you've, you've had to go through it all in order to make Poshmark what it is. And that's, that's sometimes what it takes. That's incredible. So talk to me about the social aspects that you built into the system at first, right? This is a very unique platform because it's social commerce. In many ways, it's, it's a unique place because fashion is such a large sector of the economy, maybe as big as real estate. You know, for Airbnb and Poshmark, for me, appear to be sort of the leading companies for building these marketplaces. It's also unique because of the level of passion. Um, and that, that people have for it. The frequency and the passion that, that the, the buyers and sellers have is very unique. It gives you an opportunity to build a social commerce product unlike any other. So it's good fertile soil for sure. You didn't make that up. You, you saw that and you dove into that fertile soil. How did you till and then, and then plant that fertile soil? What were the features that you feel like really started to get the social part of the commerce? So social was very core to what we built. And it is, to me, when we think of community and social, you can't make it a feature. It has to be embedded in the very soul of your product. And I think every product and every um, platform is, at the end of the day, a community, whether you consciously inculcate it or you unconsciously inculcate it. We're part of a community. That's how we connect it as, uh, as a venture community. But I would say for us, the first insight was how do people connect around fashion, in particular, how women connect around fashion. And um, one of the things, for example, in Poshmark we don't have is public ratings of sellers, which is very contrary to almost any other marketplace in the world. The reason we didn't do it is because when you leave a rating on an item that's in a closet, it's almost like you're personally rating the style of that person. And so a three-star rating isn't three-star on the transaction. It's three-star that reflects my personal style. Imagine how you feel as if that happened. So it was built with that empathy. Second thing was we took was there was no private communication mm-hmm. between the buyer and seller. Like so on everything Twitter, was social. Yeah. Much, almost yeah. everything, everything is Everything is social, public. which was a big risk right. for both the seller and buyer. What if somebody got into a big... Right. And they, they do, I mean, occasionally, but the openness of the conversation actually inculcated good behavior and transparent behavior and a level of sort of transparency on the dispute and the conversation. And in fact, many people have told us that the reason they like it, our platform, is because they don't get strange direct messages, you know, in the, in the system. And then the third thing which is there uh, on the platform is 
that there are so many ways to connect people and everything happens through the people discovery and the connection of the people. So, so when you think about sort of social communications, no public rating and, and a lot of sort of social discovery and initially you connect and you follow people, those were sort of the foundations of it. But the magical glue was the following notion, which is as you are listing the products, as you're shopping the products, you can also curate them. So there is this button called the share button. And what happens with that is you can share your own items to your followers, but you can also share somebody else's items to the followers. Now, if you think about that, that was one of the most controversial features that you know we built. And I was sort of very much pro it. And at various point in time, I had to defend that feature. Even today, people tune into it. But this is such a powerful thing because it's this one button which really allows products to be propagated in different things, into parties, into styling, into your followers. And now for a seller, curating the allows them to show their style, mm-hmm. right? I it don't own allows, this, but I like this. Exactly. So their followers get a greater sense exactly. of their style. Exactly. And it allows the followers to discover new sellers. And so beyond sort of curation of items, it also is a way for sellers to connect their followers to other sellers. Mm-hmm. So we're probably the only marketplace mm-hmm. where sellers actively spend anywhere from a fourth to half their time promoting other sellers. Yeah which is very strange, so right? It's very strange and it's very unique to you guys. And it's another rule that you've broken that, um, that fits with all the other rules you've broken. And this balance between following people, but then looking for things to buy is a very delicate one, right? Because it's generally about people. But if you don't focus on the items, then the conversion rate goes down and you want the growth of the company to go up. So maybe you need to focus more on the products and not less on the people. But maintaining that balance, that flying that plane, as I say, between the commerce part of it and the social part of it, I think has been one of the more remarkable things you guys have done. And I don't know that many other people who've even tried it, let alone anybody who's accomplished it. This idea that you could get them to to share other people's uh, closets, other people's items to, to sell where it doesn't benefit them at all, other than socially. But it does benefit them socially because there's such a, an amount of, of value placed in the community on your reputation, right? And how, who you're connected to, but without the ratings. And that's the critical thing. Yeah. So ultimately for us, the, the balance between what I call love and money is so critical. So one of our core values is lead with love and money follows. When you lead with money, nothing happens. Uh, and my personal sort of belief is that when you look at a decision you have to make, when you look at an experience you want to create, there's three places from which you can come and make that decision. One is a place of fear. I'm afraid of competition. I'm afraid somebody's going to kill me. The other is a place of greed. Let me have more of it, more of it. And third is sort of this place of love. A lot of times when you're sort of intentionally feeling afraid or feeling scared or feeling depressed, if you can center yourself and make that decision a place of love, you always win. And I find that to be very true about product decisions that we make around that evolution, because there are times you feel, oh my God, the sky is falling. You know, the business is not growing, or this is not happening, or that's not happening. There's a place of fear. Then there's times where some things are going really good. And the idea is, how do we raise prices? How do we maximize that, right? But neither of those are good places to be. Because when you create a virtuous cycle, you serve your customers, and you come from a place of love, then you create a perpetual wheel and a perpetual relationship that is beautiful and winning. So if you look at one of the core principles for us is, There is nothing that we do which is really making money orthogonally from sellers. We all make money together. We make money when we serve a customer. And our goal is to empower our seller community to serve their customers better. When they serve their customers better, customers come back and build a deeper relationship to the sellers. And ultimately, as they sort of scale their businesses, we scale our business and our platform, and it becomes a very symbiotic sort of partnership. Yeah. But Manish, how do you come from a place of love when most people are operating from fear and greed? You're surrounded by good people. They've grown up with fear. They've grown up with greed or they've learned greed. How do you, how do, you do that personally and as, as a leader? I think um, one of the things that, you know, if you think about it, we all have tremendous what I call existential angst, right? And it comes at different points in time. Meaning, it comes, meaning, meaning it am could I valuable? Be, am, am I valuable? Am I, am I good? Am I loved? Am I worthy enough? You know, how do I compare myself to other people? So, what's my existence mean? What does the my existence mean? Yeah. So, there's many principles we've tried to do at different points in time, and that's been very magical to our culture. And you know, you continue to have to work at it. So, it's not that you can get rid of existential gangs; it's part of our life, but. 
what can we do to help alleviate it? How can we make the playing field simpler? How can we make it sort of, it's more transparent? Um, it starts from how we compensate people. It starts for how we inculcate growth. Uh, so if you think about everyone who joined us in 11, 12, in the early years is still here. They're still all growing. And we've certainly added, I think we were like 20, 30, 40 people now, and we are 400 people now. So we certainly added more people here. We're 400 people now. Yeah, but continue to grow every person uh, through that journey. So we have folks who joined us um, who are maybe doing something completely different. Maybe they were um, working in the front offices of a retail outlet who are running a team of maybe 60 people today mm -hmm. in the company or someone who may have never been in a company more than 10, 20 people who is now in a senior leadership position. So inculcating growth internally and the same time for a seller community, providing them with ways of growth. We've had people who came in and maybe sold a few items from their closet and now run two different fashion brand lines on Poshmark with thousands Thousands of other sellers carry their brand on Poshmark and they're scaling to seven figure businesses. Since both continue to grow internally, because growth in my mind leads to happiness. And then the second thing is how do you sort of remove some of the common angst that happens as much as you can, right? right, I mean, right. That's what you can, I mean, it's, you know? it's, what I hear you saying is you, you've got to identify and then demonstrate abundance to the people Very internally. Very beautifully said. As always, you have the better way of expressing what I'm saying, James. <laughs> well, it's just, it's, 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 a, but you're actually doing it, Manish. That's the thing. You're doing it with with how you're running Poshmark and what you're doing for your team. The fact that everyone from the beginning is still here after eight years, think about that. That's amazing. Well done. When you think of some of the, the harder times, I mean, you know, look, you guys are just getting going. You've got another 10, 20 years of, of growth as, as, as a company and as you as the CEO, you can go forever with this. You can go into home and fashion, you know, home products. You can go into men's and babies and you've done all that. And, and you're now becoming this, this platform for buying all sorts of things um, from people. You know, that social platform that we all hoped we would see 10 years ago is now coming true. We're just getting going. But what are some of the things that you had to get over to get here? What are, what are some of those moments when it was sort of the worst? And you're going to have to get through some of those moments maybe in the future, right? When you want to go from, you know, 400 people to 4,000 and from 4,000 to 40,000. Um, you know, you're going to have to get through some hard times again. How did you get through some of the hard times? What were some of the hard times and how did you get through them? Well, um, I'll give you one time frame, which was, I think, um, I mean, 2014 was an interesting year because we didn't have much money in the bank at that time. We were operating this company, trying to grow because this was the time where we had just stall growth and we were growing again. And um, we recruited some amazing leaders who are still here. You know, John McDonald joined us in late 13, early 14. Uh, he's a chief operating officer today. Barca, who's a chief data officer, joined us. They joined us because of the strength of conviction. Uh, I was very transparent for them, you know, where we were. How much money uh, was left. Yeah, and, and what's there. What the growth and, rate was at the yeah, time. It wasn't. It wasn't there. And yeah. they all, you know are still here and help us grow and, and you know work through those things. And it was amazing times in 14 to learn the level of learnings we had. What we discovered is how much love our community had. Even when we'd cut down all of marketing, the business was still growing because of the intense engagement our community has in, around the platform. But uh, fall of 15, where we've grown very, very fast. And um, we had at that point been rejected by 200 different investors. If you name an investor, we, we probably pitched to them and gotten rejected by them, right? Uh, it was a crazy time. We were, um, I remember sitting with Tracy at this uh, coffee house in San Francisco. I was one other investor who felt compelled because they really loved us, but they want to give us money to call us and tell us that, you know, sorry, can't give you the money. And I was like, I don't even want to take this call. I know what he's going to. And, and it, was, it was a really difficult time. But, you know, one of the things that happened in that time frame was, you know, for me, our mindset is, you know, continuously learning. So everything that's bad, we learn from it. One of the investors had asked us to provide them with data in a very specific form. And so as, as I was looking at that data, as we were giving them, I don't know why this, I was like frustrated, you know, this is another kind of data that these guys want and grumpy because, you know, I was like getting painfully uh, end of our uh, investment rounds. And, uh, and as that data was being cut and, and, and put together, I looked at those numbers. And what was funny was this entire spreadsheet of maybe a thousand cells had the same number or close to the same number. I said, what? And, was a, and what it told me was how robust mm. the cohorts of the platform were because we'd never looked at that from a different perspective, which allowed us to make judicious business decisions in the future mm. and turn sort of the exact economics of the business around. And so one so, of the So things, there was an investor who was yeah, going to say no to you. Who but did the, say no to who us. did say no to you, but in the process showed you a way of looking at your data, which gave you an insight. And you learned from that. You didn't just 
take their rejection and say, well, they're idiots. You said, there's something to learn here. Wait a minute. And that has helped you in the years it, after. It growth. And so what I, what I find is that in general, when people are giving you feet, it's very hard to accept it at the moment. But there's wisdom in it. Even in the worst critic, there's wisdom. So even when my community today is up in arms, when investors are criticizing you or your team is criticizing you about something, if you can, and it's very hard at that moment to take that feedback. But over time, if you can absorb that feedback, there is some wisdom in it. There's some ways to process and evolve. And if you evolve, you grow. And I believe a business, if the leaders are not growing, then the business can't grow. So a business doesn't not grow because of competition. It doesn't not grow because of investment. It doesn't, it stops growing when the leaders stop growing. And so part of it was that there were beliefs, there were sort of axioms in the business that had to be challenged. And that data challenged that axiom and it broke why, something like it broke, broke the something it broke the broke broke up broke an yeah. assumption yeah. that oh my god the system is sensitive to this data point and it wasn't and that allows you to fine tune the system once you do it unlocks a whole new sort of engine of growth and many times you need a leader who believes in it on either on a distribution <laughs> side on a particular area right so so i mean this is such a great example of where these decisions are unclear. You've got a very complicated business. You don't have the, the team necessarily in place or they're just getting in place. You know, the capital is only a certain amount of capital. You know, you guys had the, de the decision to move more toward new products, right? Because it had all been used up until that. And now it's a lot more used, um, a lot more new than it was back then. Um, the integrations with the fashion providers and, and the partnerships with them was all still to be done on the women's side. And that could be a very viable way to go. And I'll be honest, that's kind of what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to get more into new and more into the, and lock yeah. down the women's. Yeah. And then maybe a year, two years from now, let's go after other categories then. But you're like, no, let's do it now. And Hans wanted to do it now. And there was all these different disagreements. And in the end, once you did it, it was hard. After you made the decision to go broad, the broadness was kind of hard. Things weren't really taking off. And so it kind of looked for a year like, well, maybe that wasn't the best decision. And it took it two years to actually fully make it work. Right. And so I think this is just such a great lesson for all founders that there's all these decisions that we make that we don't know at the time. There's lots of good arguments on both sides. And in the end, you have to have a guiding light. And you had that guiding light, which is I want to be the platform and I want to do it with love. And that ended up being right for you because you and your team, Tracy and, and Leanne, were, have been navigating this thing from that perspective and therefore it worked for you. And had it been another team, it might not have worked. I think there's another dimension, James, which, you know, you were sort of very, very important in that mentorship process is what are the decisions you make around your team during these phases of mass upheaval? Uh, you remember that conversation, I think it was in 16 or 17, when we were talking about senior leadership in the company and how to evolve it. I think one of the pieces that I feel very proud of is that we've been able to add tremendous number of senior leaders in the business. And at the same time, continue to grow our original set of leaders into bigger and bigger roles. And this bridging, I remember, was one of your pieces of wisdom, was that creates a strength that is really powerful. When you have people who've been with you for a long time, married with people who are bringing in, needed for the next phase of growth and, and, and bringing it together. And that, to me, I think is very unique about our company. You don't see that a lot in Silicon Valley where each generation of leaders kind of churn and, you know, the wisdom is let's get the best people and these people don't scale and that people. And what I've found is that, you know, nobody interviewed me every year to say, am I the right CEO for the next job? Mm. Right. <laughs> I was just given that job, right? So <laughs> Yeah, you gave yourself yeah, that job. So I, you took I, it I was on. like, fine, you know, and so why should people who are working this team not be given that opportunity? Mm -hmm. And that sort of the ability to give them the right level of support, not just by me, but right. people that they needed to, has allowed them to scale. And what happens today is that we have both a true north which comes from people who've been around for a long time and evolution and innovation. And, and, and in our time, people become the true North because, you know, for example, somebody who joined three years back is there. And that period of 16, 17, 18 was a tremendous year. Uh, we have last three years have been of, you know, growth in senior leadership, growth in core leadership. Uh, for example, Leanne, who joined us in the early days as a community manager, now manages a team of 150, 170 people that spans the world. And so uh, so that's sort of seeing, seeing her grow and take on that leadership role at different scales and stages has been a very interesting journey because as much as we are growing as leaders, you know, if you can have the other leaders grow, and I really credit you for sort of that core nugget of wisdom about this bridging approach of, of first generation leadership, second 
second generation or the third generation, if you can preserve the best elements, of course, some leaders will not work out and some folks in, and, and all of that. But broadly, if you can keep it along, it creates a much stronger business, much stronger Give them, give them stronger new projects, community. give them new responsibilities, put them in places where it, it serves them and serves their transformation, their growth. And we've seen that even in our community. We've seen people who have been with the community since the very beginning scale up. Some people for a couple of years left and then rejoin. And we've seen that in the company as well. For example, Maria, who's heading up our Canadian team, left the company for a couple of years. We recruited her to now head up Canada and open up Poshmark Canada for us. So, so it's just this ability to sort of create this ecosystem which can come together, take the business to the next level. Maybe there's different parts to the journey, kind of go there and then come together and take it to the next level. Has been fun to watch and see. And that gives me, again, hope that the culture we've created both in the community and in the company can continue scale because scale and evolve, of course, and because it has to evolve naturally. But each of those things are very powerful because they are required for something to be healthy and viable for a long period of time. Totally. And, you know, you guys have a network effect now that just will not quit. Uh, and we've seen how powerful those are. And now you have a culture that will not quit. And uh, we've seen how powerful those are as well. The DNA of that um, those two things combined tell me that this company is going to be here for a long, long time, long after you're retired, uh, which is going to be another 20, 30 years, hopefully. So, um, <laughs> now, two, two things I wanted to get at before, before we end here. Um, is there anything that we should talk about as lessons for founders around your fundraising journey? Very important. I think um, one of the things that I have found about the fundraising journey is that the market feedback on your business broadly is very accurate. Uh, early days different, you know, when you're doing it on the belief. And if you don't take that market feedback seriously and process it and factor it into your business, you will keep running against that wall. And whether that feedback is on growth, that's unit economics, profitability, processing it is important. How you act on it is, of course, up to you. And so I would say the first set of point in 14, when we went out, we got this feedback. We didn't Take it seriously. We thought, you know, these guys just don't understand our business, da, da, da. In 15, we did. And there's a big difference. We accepted the feedback. We processed it. And, and from that point onwards, every time I have a meeting with someone, whether it is a customer, of course, you know, you take your customer's feedback seriously. Totally. And so why not your investor's feedback and on the sale of your stock, right? And videos. so it's very, very they're important. Yeah. And, and their specific suggestion on how to fix it may be off, but their feedback on how they see your business mm -hmm. is going to be important at every stage. Mm -hmm. And how you choose to act on it is yours. But if you don't act on it and you reject it, then you would not be able to build the business to the next level, which requires the next level of capital, fundraise, et cetera. And so, so that has been sort of a journey that has been interesting at different stages on, on fundraising. The second thing is, the ability to simplify and simplify and simplify your message uh, in terms of what you're trying to do and be able to describe it uh, is, is, is there. And third thing is as the business scales uh, and then business has real revenue and, and, and real sort of uh, uh, economics that are happening, at that point in time, the business is going to be valued more from a you know, metrics, metrics perspective and, and all of that. And you better have sort of an understanding of that. So those are so different phases like different of the journey. Phases of, of the journey. You know, at the beginning, it's on belief and personality and on, you know, changes to technology. And then it's about, you know, the, the core metrics. And then, and then later on, it's about the size of those core metrics, right? And, and those are three different audiences from a, from a fundraising perspective, and they, they have different languages. And if 20 investors mm -hmm. are giving you one feedback, particularly venture investors, mm -hmm. and you're not processing it fully, and then you're missing something. Feedback could be around TAM, right? And you might be like, oh, it's in a big business. Feedback could be around unit economics. Feedback could be around your cost of sales. Um, they are real feedback. And a lot of times I find founders sort of disbelieving it and taking it very personally. And of course, I took it personally. All of us will take it personally. But being able to process that and figure out how you sort of act on it so you can come back is very important. And come back in a simple way. I think I think your point about simplicity is so key. I think as founders, we we want our souls to be seen and validated. <laughs> we want the investors to validate how complex our lives and our businesses are and how smart we are to have overcome what we've overcome so far <laughs> and how far we've come. And really, they just want it to be incredibly simple uh, because they're looking at another six deals that day. And they're like, what are you doing? Why? You know? And so it's, it's, uh, it's sort of a little heart-wrenching to make it more simple and more simple. 
but that's what's required to actually communicate. And you find that's true with uh, the customers as well. Um, so having ha seeing those venture people as and those investors as customers uh, and simplifying for their benefit is is part of the journey. Um, the other dimension I think in in the in the growth journey is being able to attract and grow the team that you have. And I think making the room for people around you and, and growing them is really, really important. And each area of growth and financing, there will be people who will come and join your team who are gonna lead. And um, it takes time to make room for them, right, at each stage. Uh, to and onboard then them properly. Onboard them properly, figuring the out how to work the with them, the right partnership, yeah. how to sort of bring it along. And, and at each stage, because you're attracting, uh, and then you find that founders who are able to do that incredibly well, you know, like Scott Cook or even Mark Zuckerberg and, and many others just have different scale of businesses that you end up building, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, it's all about not just the community you're creating, not just the team, but the community of leaders that you're creating right. around you. So identify, attract, and then onboard, onboard integrate. Right integrate yeah. them. And getting the best of that talent. And mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the talent comes through networks. Sometimes you have to get people who are great professionals at them. You know, so executive recruiting is something sometimes people say, oh, it doesn't work. And I find it to be an incredible tool incredible. to get best access to the best talent out there. And that money it's the cheapest is money 100, 100x ROI yeah. um, across the board. And that's super, you know, important. And the third thing is, I feel like at each stage of the business, you have to change how you operate. And um, last year, middle of last year, um, I was going, going through this sort of six month process in the first half of 2018, where I felt like I was just running from one meeting to the other and, and just, you know, sort of like feeling very stressed and tired and exhausted. And prior to that, I never felt that. Like it was just sort of like, I was like, what's going on? And so I sat back and scratched my head and said, you know, how do I sort of re-vector how I operate? because clearly I'm creating all of this stress. People are stressed, everyone's sort of energized and we should be really energized. Mm -hmm. And so I created something called CEO time. So instead of going to meetings, now meetings come to me. Mm -hmm. And what I did was each CEO time is given to a functional leader who needs to engage with me. And they're usually either repeated every week or every other week. They create the agenda. Mm -hmm. They prepare for that meeting. And in those two hours, they can either ask for a decision, educate me, brainstorm, inform me, or sort of change something. Mm -hmm. Uh, and their teams, and they invite the right cross-functional teams for that. In those two hours, I'm 100% focused on them and their business. So whether it is around data or product or HR or what have you, and you make a lot of decisions in that process. And it has completely streamlined my calendar. And then these executives are sort of reworking it. I've stopped, you know, I can sit here and talk to you for an hour instead of running to 10 meetings because the calendar is completely restructured. And that has been a meaningful shift and I couldn't talk about it because I wanted to practice for at least a year. Now it's been a year yeah. and it's working reasonably well. I mean, there's stuff you have to fix. That's been very powerful for us. I want to ask one more question, which is what's next for Poshmark? So for us, we're very excited about three things. One is um, including more of the world in, in our community. So we are planning to launch Poshmark Canada very soon and uh, super excited about it. So I, right now it only operates in the United and States? Only in the United States That's today. Right. Uh, so it's very exciting. I think by the time probably this podcast goes live, we'll be live in Canada. Uh, second is we believe that our social commerce platform can serve beyond fashion. And so we intend to go into adjacent categories and sort of open up there. Uh, so the first broad category beyond fashion that we want to open up is home and home decor, which is, you know, in many ways, my consumer journey, 15 years started there. So I'm excited about that. And third thing is coming up with new ways in which people can engage with each other and interact with each other on platform. Um, you know, things like video, things like styling, you know, different kinds of communication. So we expect to to sort of evolve and and and, uh, and energize around that. And so, which is, you know, again, the same thing. More people, more ways in which they can transact and sort of sell and buy, and then just more love between them. Wow, this reinvention, this constant reinvention, Manisha, changing you know the the places you lived every two or three years as a kid, and now you're changing how you run your business every two or three years. It's the same thing. It's it's an amazing superpower you have. That's amazing. That's a great way to end. Thank you, Manish. It's a real Thanks, pleasure. James. Thank you. So that was Manish Chandra from Poshmark down in Redwood City, California. 
This is the NFX Podcast. You can learn more about network effects, growth, fundraising, and building iconic companies at nfx.com. Follow us on Twitter at NFX Guild, N-F-X-G-U-I-L-D.